cocker. With a cocker, who I, yep. Now, <laughs> strangely enough, this photo was also taken in 1900. Uh, my grandfather was, this is my grandfather, Jimmy. He was four years old, and uh, he's, there, he's there in Lenox. Uh, the way the story was related to me, the, the groundsman that took care of the Breezy Corner property also uh, handled the Lenox Golf Club. So as a youngster, Jimmy would follow these guys across the street. They, they, the coachman's cottage was literally across the street from the golf club. So he started out by uh, looking for stray golf balls, and then he was hitting golf balls with tree branches. And uh, at the age of 10, he became a caddy at the Lenox Golf Club. Uh, and uh, he, he was pretty good because at the age of 18, he was hired as the golf pro, uh, and I might mispronounce this name, Wintenock is the country club in, in Great, Great Barrington. Barrington. Wyantanock. Wyantanock, okay. Yeah. Um, so there he is, he's 18 and he's a golf pro, but along came the First World War and Jimmy gets drafted. And it's interesting, somebody once wrote is that they must have known something by putting it in the artillery because he hit those little white pellets straight <laughs> down the fairway every time. So he, he was in the artillery dur during the war. When, when Jimmy came back from the war, the f it was at a time of the year when the family was in Philadelphia. So he got a job as an assistant pro at a, a, a very fancy Philadelphia suburban country club called Cedar Brook Golf Club. Um, at that time, the largest businessmen's club in the city was called the Manufacturers Club. They had a, an 11-story building at Broad and Walnut. They had privileges, their members had privileges to play golf at a number of the, uh, the area golf courses, but they wanted to have their own golf course. So they went out and they bought a property and they built a golf course. Now some of the members of this golf course were also members at Cedar Brook. So when they, when they put a search committee out to find a pro, Jimmy Cole's name came up and here he was at the age of 24, he's now the head pro at the Manufacturers Country Club. And, and it, you know, if you think about it, uh, and, and I've seen lots of things written about, uh, about Jimmy, uh, a couple of different uh, tribute, tribute pieces, uh, how easily he worked with people and, uh, and uh, was a very good teacher. Uh, I think that the relationship with the Biddles, uh, his father's occupation, being exposed to people in, in that social strata, uh, made this job very easy for him. He was comfortable with it. He also must have been a bit of a celebrity if he was um, uh, chosen for a beer ad. As yeah, <laughs> yes, this, this is, this is, this is uh, 19, 1939 in the, there was a golf magazine at the time. You know, golf was really popular in the, th I mean, it's popular today, but it was very popular in the time of Bobby Jones and, uh, you know, those people. Uh, this was in a magazine called The 19th Hole, and it's an advertisement for Valley Forge beer. <laughs> <laughs> so around this time, our Miss Emily Biddle died, and this is uh, when her, uh, her will was m made known that, uh, that the Coles learned that they were to inherit uh, an incredible fortune, as well as the house in Philadelphia and this car. And yes, mm. in, in, in the will, uh, she, she, any automobile that I own at the time of my death, she gave to Michael Cole. And, uh, when, when, you know, I, I told Nini recently, I drove into Center City, Philadelphia, and I walked down the street of where the Delancey Place house was. And as I stood across the street and I looked at the house, and, and I might add as an aside, 
the house was featured on the back cover of Philadelphia Magazine in January and for a price of $1.9 million. But it said one of the best houses on the best blocks of the city. So, uh, you know, I pictured Michael sitting in the, the LaSalle, because this was the car that she owned at the time, uh, sitting outside of that house and waiting for Miss Biddle to come out. My father, my father, one story that I did hear from my family, my father tells me that in 1935, when he went to his senior prom, uh, his, his grandfather drove him in, in, a, in this is a 1930 LaSalle. <laughs> so, there wasn't any other students from Roman Catholic High that were, <laughs> went to the prom in LaSalle. Now, uh, the house in Lennox, though, the coachman's house in Lennox, did not, was not included in the will. Uh, is, am I right in understanding no, this? No, the, uh, in the will, um, she, should I read the will? Do you, ha do you have it? Yeah, I have or it. Have we lost I it. Have, I have it. I have it. I have it. Maybe you can hold the microphone for me and uh, I'll hold this and read it. This is a couple paragraphs from Emily's will that uh, refer to my family. It says, in recognition of faithful and cheerful services for many years of my coachman, Michael Cole, I give and bequeath to the Pennsylvania Company for Insurance on Lives and Granting Annuities, the sum of $45,000, in trust nevertheless for the following use and purpose, to invest the said sum and collect the income, rents, issues, and profits thereof, and after deducting all proper expenses for the execution of this trust to pay to the said Michael Cole out of the net income the sum of $175 per month for the full term of his natural life. And from and after the decease of the said Michael Cole to pay the said sum of $175 per month to his wife, Susan Cole, should she survive his. For the full term of her natural life and upon the death of both the said Michael Cole and his wife Susan, then to, to convey a signed transfer and pay over the principal to my residuary legalities. In the event that the net income derived from said trust should at any time prove insufficient for the payment of the sum of $175 per month, I authorize and direct my trustees to use so much of the principal as, as, as may be necessary to complete said monthly payments. In the event that the net income of said trust should at any time prove more than sufficient for the payment of uh, the sum of $175 per month, I authorize and direct the trustees to pay that money over to the, to the re residuary legalities. In making investments and reinvestments of the principal of the said trust, um, any unexpended income thereof should be directed. I give, devise, and bequeath to the said Michael Cole, absolutely and in fee simple, the dwelling at house number 2030 South 59th Street, Philadelphia, in which he now resides. I further give and bequeath to the said Michael Cole any automobile which my, I may own at the time of my death. Also, I give and bequeath to Susan Cole, Jr. and Rita Cole, daughters of the said coachman, the sum of $300 and also give and bequeath to Annie Cole Lynch um, the sum of $200. So, there we go. Thank you. Um, but the house in Lennox uh, was, uh, was left to, um, at, with all of the Breezy Corner property, was left to um, Emily's nephews, the Cadwallader boys. <laughs> now, this was a large group of boys. 
adorable picture of them as children. Um, but explain what they did. Well, the Cadwallader boys were Emily's, really, they were her only heirs. They were her sister's children. And uh, they were her only relatives, right, Sarah? And uh, she left all of the Lennox property to them, which included uh, Breezy Corner and also included the property up the street on Cliffwood Street where the Coachman's Cottage was. I was uh, just flabbergasted when I got a copy of the deed. What, what happened, uh, well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, on the day that they took, that the deed was probated, in 1932, they sold the entire eight and a half acres and the coachman's cottage to Rita and Susie Cole for the sum of $2,500. Now, uh, I assume that, it, you know, this was after the crash. It was after the installation of the income tax. Uh, there was a time when maybe Cliffwood real estate might have been worth 8,000 an acre or something, mm -hmm. is that possible? I mean, I mean, some of the yeah. real estate down by the lake was probably $20,000, right? Um, <clears throat> so the value was diminished, but it wasn't diminished to $2,500. So, uh, you know, uh, again, I have to hypothesize, but uh, these boys spent their summers in Lenox. I think they were well acquainted with my family. They were well acquainted with Michael. And um, I'm, I'm sure that they were pretty well fixed at the time, but it was very generous of them. And you can see the, the six of them and their spouses signed that deed and sold the property for $2,500. And of course, <clears throat> uh, it, it wasn't purchased by Michael. I'm sure that Michael arranged for the property to be put in the name of the girls because they were not married and he, he, he and, uh, and my great-grandmother were getting older, and uh, this was security for them. And the, and the way that it worked out over the years, every time Rita and Susie needed a little money, somebody built another house there on Cliffwood Street. They would sell a building lot, and they, you know, they were good to go for a while. So we have one more picture of Michael here, taken a month before he died with four generations of Coles. This, that's Jimmy, the golfer? That's Jimmy, the golfer. That's my father, my father, Jimmy. He, my father was, he had just come home from uh, England. He was a B-17 pilot. And uh, this is my older sister, Sue. And at the time when Michael Cole died, um, your mother was about to have you. Yes. So you never yes. met him? No. No, no. Um, uh, Michael died September 21st, 1946, and I was born November 20th, 1946. So here we have, uh, we'll, uh, could we have a show of hands of anyone who remembers the, the Mrs. Cole? I know, Nolan's, you, yep, <laughs> come on. <laughs> the, the, this is a photograph of my, of my grandfather, Jimmy the golfer, and, and his sisters. So uh, you have Rita and Susie on the end, and uh, in the pink striped dress is uh, Anne. And they lived on, on, uh, on Cliffwood Street into um, the 1970s, is that right? E into the 1970s, and, and then uh, they, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, both Rita and Susie were in the nursing home on Sunset. Mm -hmm. Right. So today, as it happens, Jim lives um, 15 minutes away from Miss Biddle's grave, which is this one here. Yes, Emily's, Emily's buried in, uh, at St. Thomas Church in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania, which is right down the road from my house, and uh, I've been to visit her grave uh, more than a couple of times. And here at St. Anne's is the coal grave, um, which I can visit. <laughs> <laughs> and today, uh, the beautiful Breezy Corner is owned and has been owned by Suzanne Pelton's family for longer than the Biddle. So Suzanne, make yourself known there. <laughs> <laughs> so 
we would be glad to ask uh, if you had any questions before. Be before I answer a question, I wanted mm -hmm. to I wanted to thank. Uh, f first off, I want to thank Sarah Greenleaf because without uh, the information that I got from Sarah, this story never would have been told. And I want to thank uh, the Pelton Peltons for Suzanne uh, Pelton and David. Mm -hmm. Uh, for their hospitality because I've stayed there in the house. What a thrill it was to stay in the house where uh, my great-grandfather had worked uh, all, those, all those years ago. And, uh, and I also want to thank uh, my cousin, Michael Schimpf, who has taken me uh, from 80% of the way to 100% to get all this history of the Cole family, okay? And also Deidre Duffin be because the plan for this lecture was hatched at her dining room table. Uh, so so the, the Duffins were lived across the street from the Coles, and it was through Dee Dee that we could really reconstruct so much of this story, and Dee Dee was really great. Uh, Oh. Well, <laughs> well, listen, and, 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 and a after seeing the photograph of Michael and that Steve McQueen thing that he had <laughs> going on, uh, that was the reaction of a lot of the people. But, w you know, as I think about it, um, y you know, those kind of relationships don't end 50 years later. You know, usually they fall apart somewhere along the line ahead of that. But um, uh, <laughs> it's certainly, certainly, cer certainly something to think about. <laughs> that's that's funny because yeah. so many people have said that to me, but, but nobody ever is, said this that. Is this is nearer the source. This is coming <laughs> from his daughter. So. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 if, if, they, if that was going on, there was no hard feelings, I could tell you that, because Susie and, and, Susie and Rita and the girls were devoted to Miss Biddle. Mm -hmm. Oh, Tiasha? I was under the impression that the little house at the, at the foot of this garden was a, a little coastal. Well, it, yes, it, yes, that was, that was the carriage house. It was. And I believe probably, you know, uh, I don't know whether Michael stayed in the carriage house or in the main house at Breezy Corner those first couple of years that he came. But, uh, but uh, after 1886, they built the Coastman's Cottage up, up the street. And I think Nene can mm -hmm. say, well, the, at some point, the carriage house was sold off from the, the uh, Breezy Corner property. I can speak to that. The carriage house actually did have a bedroom in it. There was a, if you walked into the carriage house, there was a staircase going up on the It was just a little room where the, where the carriage Well, that, that, that makes sense because most of the coachman or, or the chauffeur usually stayed in the garage or the carriage house. Right. Yeah. So there's a little bedroom there. And um, when my parents bought the house in 1946, they, they sold off the, the um, carriage house, which became a, a private residence at that time. Before that, the family who owned this house before used that as their garage. Yeah. I, I think it's a great little house today, you know, when I see it, I think it's... Uh, I really have a picture of it. It's an adorable little Yes, house. yes it is. <sighs> Joe. The, uh, way back when the sisters were alive on Clifford Street, and we were quite friendly with them, there was a story about the manner in which they, came, they left London in the fall to go to, Phil to, go to Philadelphia, and the manner in which they went horse and wagon and the route they had to take. Well, uh, no, actually... It, Repeat in, the in, question, in, in, because it may not okay, be... Okay, the question always. was that uh, back in the early days of coming to Lenox, uh, did they come up on with the horse and the carriage uh, uh, be, be from Philadelphia to Lenox or back and forth? Uh, with all the research that I did, Joe, uh, it seems that they put the carriage on the train and they put the horses on the train and they came up. They came up that way. Okay. Uh, however, when once the automobile came along, 
when we, the first, uh, the first date that I have of Miss Biddle having an automobile is around 1910, where there's some references to her taking motor trips to different places in, in New England. So by the 20s, Michael was driving Miss Biddle. They were making the trip. <laughs> that was a bill car. It had silk shades in the back. It was quite an article. But how how long ago was that? They sold it in the seventies. Wow. <laughs> wow. I never I haven't heard that story. It was controversial. Somebody kind of wrestled it away from it. <laughs> yeah, well I could see that happening. Yeah. Did you have a question? <laughs> not not very well. <laughs> he's trying to he, he's he's trying to break a hundred and ten right now. What did the coachman do other than being on call to drive Miss Biddle? Well, y you know, it, it, the coachman for a, f a family like the Biddles was it was probably the most. Uh, 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 it was a prominent position. You were out front with the family. Uh, so it was very important that, uh, that, that they had somebody that had a good personality, some